All right, looks like we've got the good to go signal and we're ready to start. Great. So welcome back everybody. Um, thank you so much for your support and coming and uh, we are uh, here for day three, our final day. And since this is the, uh, the opening session, we just wanna uh, say a few words of thanks again. Um, the, uh, we'd like to thank um, again, the Audio Engineering Society. Uh, Lawrence, if you could advance the slide, and I might not be seeing it, but yeah, there it is. Yeah, there it um, is. And of course, DigiPen, our host institution, and uh, the present all of the presenters, uh, those that are also going to present today. Uh, it's just been a very gratifying thing for for Lawrence and myself and the, the uh, entire AVAR committee uh, to see people enjoying the conference. Um, so thank you all for your feedback and for uh, sticking with it and uh, helping us to get through some of these technical technical people and issues. But we've uh, we've really enjoyed it, and um, I hope you have as well. Yeah, um, we've had we've had a lot of fun. <laughs> we hope you have too. In spite of uh, the 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 bleeding edge uh, that we're at, I think it's given us an opportunity to interact and perhaps a, a new way and um, we just we appreciate everybody's uh, participation and patience and I would remind all of us if, if you have uh, the stamina in between uh, there on the schedule they're called coffee breaks I think uh, so join us in the Avar lobby it's, it's been some of my um, most uh, favorite uh, events at the conference just to hang out in the lobby and chat with you all so uh, feel free to do that I just want to do also a quick shout out to the Pacific Northwest section of the Audio Engineering Society. Greg Dixon is the chair of the uh, committee and uh, Dan Mortensen is also on the committee. They're both here in yellow shirts as volunteers so you can talk to either Greg Dixon or Dan Mortensen. The PNW section is going to hold a special AVAR 2020 um, review uh, uh, very shortly um, later this uh, later in September. So uh, stay tuned for that. You can go to the PNW section to read more about that. And finally, thanks to the Avar volunteer team. Can we get some emojis for those guys? Um, it's it's a it's been a team of uh, I don't know how many uh, of people there. Students from DigiPen. Dustin uh, Williams, our sound lab manager. DigiPen is the volunteer team coordinator. Oh, look at all that! <laughs> look at all that love. <laughs> Thank you, folks. Um, we couldn't have done this without them. Um, they're the folks in the yellow shirts. They're streaming live to YouTube. There are two streams for redundancy on YouTube, so you can go to the AES uh, uh, AVAR 2020 page to watch these streams uh, after the fact or even during the fact. If you're having issues, um, particularly for the keynote presentation with Poppy's videos, um, just feel free to pop on over to the live stream and watch them on YouTube because um, the streamers are, are having good, good results with their continuity. Uh, Matt, do you want to um, introduce Sally? <laughs> yes, um, Sally Calloway um, at Microsoft is our workshops chair. Um, if you've been over in the workshops uh, sessions, you've seen her there. Um, thanks so much, Sally. And uh, I'm just going to pass it right over to Sally to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you so much. I think I might do it just from here to save myself walking to the other side of the stage. Yeah, it's uh, a long but... way to go. I know, and we're all so eager to hear what Poppy has to say in her keynote as well. So thank you again. Thank you, everyone, for coming along to this the final day of this wonderful conference. And we're all super excited to hear um, this fantastic keynote from this amazing speaker, Poppy Crum. So Dr. Poppy Crum is the chief scientist at Dolby Laboratories, which is probably the coolest job title that you could have ever. Uh, she is also the adjunct professor at Stanford University in the Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics and the program in Symbolic Systems. At Dolby, Poppy directs the growth of internal science. She is responsible for integrating neuroscience and sensory data science into algorithm design, technological development, and technology strategy. At Stanford, her work focuses on the impact and feedback potential of new technologies, including gaming and immersive environments, such as augmented and virtual reality, on neuroplasticity and learning. She is a 2018 uh, recipient of the Advanced Imaging Society's Distinguished Leadership Award, a 2017 re recipient of the Consumer Technologies Association's Technology and Standards Achievement Award for work towards the introduction of over-the-counter hearing aid devices 
and has been named to Billboard magazine's 100 most influential female executives in the music industry. She is a frequent speaker, including TED Talk, South by Southwest, IEEE, TNW, Wired, and on topics of related to the intersection of human experience, artificial intelligence, sensory data science, and immersive technologies. Today, she is a, presenting a keynote on empathetic technology and embodied user experience, and we are so pleased and proud to have her here today. Thank you, Poppy. You can pop up to the stage now. Everyone, let's show her with the emojis. Clap, clap, clap. <laughs> oh, we got her. Thank you so much, uh, Sally, and thank you everyone for that. This is an incredibly uh, cool, uh, uh, sorry, let me get up here and make sure you can, I'm in the right place. So. Okay, are we good? Can everyone see me? Just give me some <laughs> happy so I know. <laughs> okay, excellent. I'm super happy to be here. I, I am so impressed with the, I, as many, you know, there may be technical glitches, but um, and this, the transformation in experience, it's, it's really interesting and I think in, in, impactful to have everybody in these, this space uh, for these, this type of conference. So uh, Pop, kudos Poppy, sorry to, to interrupt. Um, yes. We, we would just ask you to push the on air button on your host tools. Okay. And then okay. Wait, that Am I good now? you in the other rooms. Yeah. And then if you oh, can just slide, slide over to the podium so that you're not blocking your wonderful uh, slides, that'd be great. Is that good? Okay. A little Excellent. farther if you can. I have to stand behind the podium for real? Oh, okay. Here we go. No, you don't. You can, walk, you can walk all over the stage just like You're you good. did your TED Talks, Poppy. He doesn't know what <laughs> yeah. he's talking about. <laughs> no, I just, it's fun to wander around. All right. Um, so let me just, I'm just going to come out just a little bit. There we go. All right. So let's start with this. Um, I, I have a question. When you look at this image, what comes to mind? Maybe, you, you know, right now, we obviously Earth, planet, uh, things. Can you not hear me? Someone cannot hear me. Yes. Okay. Sad faces. Does that mean people cannot? And do you have Amplify My Voice um, turned on too, Poppy? I your do. Host tools? So you've got, I, um, and the little radio hello? tower is. Radio, radio tower, tower is on. Blue. Radio tower is on. Blue, we are. Okay, so okay. is this better? Can we hear? I have on air. I have yeah. my microphone is showing. Are people hearing me or not hearing me? Now I'm just you sound yeah, great getting, to me. We're getting good response in this room, so I think we're good. Okay, so I'm going to keep going this way. Um, and if anyone has trouble hearing me, please do speak up. Or I, Matt, Matt and Lar uh, Lawrence, I'd, I'll ask you to please. I, I want to know immediately if anyone can if if the audio goes okay. All right, so we're looking at this image, Earth, planet, uh, fragility, uh, maybe a shared, um, you know, the, the shared experience we're all going through right now with the pandemic. Um, but yeah, we have different experiences to it, but they all seem, uh, I think, uh, maybe more common than, than the one I'm about to tell you. So I was in a planetarium with my two and a half year old daughter. Uh, this was maybe, uh, she, she's five now, so it was a couple of years ago. And we're watching, about to watch Journey to the Sun. And it starts as a many planetarium films start, where you're on a busy city street like LA or, or New York, and you do a zoom out on your way to the sun. And you pass an image that looks a lot like this. And of course, my two and a half year old daughter, when it's completely quiet, completely dark, yells as loud as she possibly could when this image appears. Sorry. Minions. All right. So <laughs> maybe, maybe that makes sense to some, but I, immediately I go, ah, okay. So maybe the most important thing here is what she actually is. This makes complete sense if you understand her world, because her experientially established prior of that image up to that time in her life is coming from this one, right? She'd never seen an, really an image of the earth at that perspective, except for right before her favorite little creatures were about to appear. And it points to this critical part of how we experience the world, which is, look, we all have vastly, vastly different experiences of the exact same physical and sensory information. Um, as, and 
you know, it's not just our underlying biology that drives that. It's a combination of our underlying biology. Uh, we have different uh, biological capacities and how we hear, how we see um, the, our physiology, but also our experientially established priors, um, the experiences that we've surrounded ourselves in the world and our expectations. Those things come together and create it an, instead of a physical reality, a perceptual reality that is really quite unique for each of us. And in many cases that in what we might call non-veridical experience of the world, uh, it enables us to be effective in our environments. It allows us you know, to get away from maybe the, in the past it was to hear a tiger and be able to localize it and, and effectively uh, move our bodies away from it. But today that might be instead a, a flying Uber driver in the middle of a city street that we need to be able to hear and have a quick reaction to, or finding a baby or communication in a different environment. But those weighted combinations of how our brain shapes information to give us really what is a perceptual experience that helps us be effective in those environments is really quite different and quite unique for each of us. Um, whether I grew up in a village in, a, a village in Afghanistan, a town in the mid Midwest, a city like New York or Kathmandu, the statistical nature of the distributions of these environments completely shapes how my brain uh, interacts with information in the world. It evolves my sensitivities and my sensory capacity. So if you look at the, um, if everyone can see the image I have, uh, for example, the, the image up in the top left corner, you know, has, uh, I'm seeing frowny faces. Are we not seeing, we are seeing images. Okay. All right, so the image in the top left corner has, you know, softer contours, a limited uh, set of hues. So someone's brain in that environment where they've evolved, they've spent lots of time in those spaces is going to have more allocation of their uh, sensitivity, but more, uh, more capacity to identify minor changes in a select set of hues. They're gonna be more sensitive to different contours. Uh, for example, growing, you can detect um, whether so, where someone lives just based on their hearing capacity because the noise in our environment shapes our biology. But then it also, and that may, you know, we know that, but you can detect, you can predict where someone, what city someone is in, in many cases, just based on their, hear, the type of hearing loss or hearing sensitivity they have. Now you start overlaying the environmental pressures from an urban, from a rural environment, from certain colors, certain contours, certain sounds, and how we've had to evolve in each of those environments in order, from a neuroplasticity perspective, in order to be successful. In a city, I need to be more sensitive to, in, with regard to localization. I need to interact with sound, with noise floors in a very different way. Ultimately, all these environmental pressures and exposures shape who we are and how we interact with the exact same physical information. But, we're all different, I'm telling you, but very, you know, very few of us have this, the sort of authentic abandon of my, of a two and a half year old to yell it out every time we experience it something, right? Nor do we want to. Most of us like to keep what we might call our poker face. We want to keep our internal states, our internal experiences of these environments and, and this, this, this tech, um, the, these spaces to ourselves, our stressors, our uh, emotions, our engagements, and in many cases we do, but we have to accept in some ways that technology has changed. And this can get us to a very different state. Um, we've gone from a place where, you know, we, um, detecting our emotions uh, from a computational algorithm used to be, you know, reading course, uh, course interactions of whether my face is, I'm feigning a smile or a frown to knowing that uh, technology can detect the authenticity of my emotion and whether I'm actually happy or not. Uh, we're in a place where the proliferation of sensors in our environment and the amalgamated capacity of that with machine learning and AI allows us to think very differently about how technology interacts with our internal states. But it comes with some degree of recognition that some of our cognitive sovereignty is going is something that we're going to have to uh, 
is, is going to be challenged at times. And we have to think hard about the ethical questions of when we engage with that and what it means and what it means for our engagements with each other. Now, this talk is not about, those are, those are important questions that maybe we talk about on the panel for sure. But this talk I want to focus on why it's so important to care about personalization and the opportunities that we have when we um, embrace this you know, uh, amalgamated sensing with our technology um, to capture our internal state. So three ways that I want to frame this is <clears throat> right now, there are you know, sort of three things I think are greatly impact, going to greatly impact our experiences in the next uh, few years in positive ways where technology and the human interaction and human interaction um, create are, are enabling uh, big opportunities for us to have richer experiences. And the first one is tech, what I call technology targeted neuroplasticity. It's going to make us faster, uh, recover more rapidly, hear more acutely, see more sharply and think more effectively. And what does that mean? So we've thought about plasticity for a long time. We all are aware that our brains change and they shape uh, dependent on the environments, the exposures we have to technology. And I'll touch on this at the very end of the talk more. Uh, you know, historically, rehabilitation, everything we do in the space of rehabilitating post-injury or, or after a surgery is, you know, built on our understanding of how plastic the brain is and how we can retrain it to do certain things that may have been lost in a particular um, at, at a particular time, but we've gotten much more sophisticated in how we can think about that to a point where plasticity is our tool and the, te the technology may be the same, but you can think of how you engage with the physiological system, the human on the other side, to create you know, augmented capacity that wasn't there before because it's a matter of how you, you know, you have limited set of resources, how you reallocate and optimize that the, the limited set of physiological resources to work best with the technology that's there. You can create new senses, you can enhance um, and optimize based on the technological interaction. And that pairing is, is, is very powerful. But what I'll touch on at the end is the idea that, look, I think we also have a responsibility because we can also look at it from the perspective of um, any technology we engage with for a long period of time changes us and changes us in ways that are, are, we become different humans than we were and we're changing much faster than we ever used to. But now we can think about the design and the impact of who we become before we build the technology. Because we can look at it from a neuroscience perspective, from a behavior perspective, and we can anticipate the physiological changes and how that's gonna make us different and embrace that design from the beginning. All right, so the second way is what I call empathetic technology. And it's transforming the relationship we have with each other and the spaces where we work, train, heal, and live. Now, I think when, you know, when I say empathetic technology, I'm, uh, in this case, I'm not talking about effective computing. I'm not talking about uh, avatars that are trying to emote with me. This is much more um, basic even in what we need to have in our technology, in my mind, is quite missing, which is a knowledge of our internal state, our internal... Uh, state driving how our technology behaves as one of the key drivers for it in its decision making. Uh, for example, even the most intelligent thermostat on the market today, like cannot do the most basic things that it needs to do for me to be comfortable and successful. It doesn't know if I'm hot or cold, right? It doesn't know. Um, uh, it doesn't know whether I am what I'm trying to do cognitively at that moment in time. Am I trying to be in, um, a, am I trying to uh, sleep? Am I trying to meditate? Am I trying to be cognitively effective in the middle of the day or at 2 a.m. when my body's in a very different state and I need to stay up to finish something I want to? Uh, do, does it know if I'm a woman or a man? Or maybe I'm a woman going through menopause and I, my body's in a very different state. All of these things need to be optimized for that device to be working for me in my space in a way that's helping me be optimized in the environment. I like to look at technologies like what, you know, um, if you take, uh, there's a mattress company, you know, sleep is one of the places where some of these things are accelerated, I'd say, because uh, there's uh, 
it, it's an enclosed system and it's one where people are willing to, you know, it, 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 to, to share a lot of this information to try to improve um, and optimize their experience. But you have a company like uh, Bright that's capturing physiological responses and they're paired with Nest and paired with you. So suddenly you start to have a space that's responsive to my biological optimization, uh, biological information to optimize my environment, but in a closed loop way. So empathetic technology is how do we think about everywhere where you know, technology interactions based on my internal state uh, and to drive how the technology behaves. And finally, one size fits all technology will be a thing of the past. Technology can know more about us than we know. So <clears throat> Monday's uh, Ver Varun's lecture started with a, 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 a keynote on scalability. And scalability is, you know, definitely been what's limited us. I mean, it's really critical that we solve these problems, but it's what's limited us in a lot of cases on one's uh, um, not implementing one si or it's what's driven us to implement one size fits all technology across a lot of domains where we know that one size doesn't really fit all, but either because of parallel uh, of limits on technology or costs of scalability, both in time and operational efforts or even in dissemination to consumers, we've been, we often put out technologies that we know just don't work or don't fit for a big percentage of the population. So let me give an example. Mm -hmm. Headphones. Everyone in this conference has been talking about them and thinking about them a lot. Um, this image is how I look with a lot of headphone experiences. So, <laughs> and, uh, you know, <clears throat> even the, you know, most uh, advanced, or I'd say the uh, most highest rated headphone experiences uh, for many people are broken, right? They're broken in ways that are hard to describe because it's a personal experience and that individual doesn't know what they should be experiencing in many cases, right? This is a place where as, you know, a com as companies, we create an experience and, and we want it to be compelling, but compelling may be vastly different for so many individuals. Um, any spatial, you know, again, these are topics that you've been talking about for the past three days, but I'm gonna go through them with some background anyway. Um, any spatial audio experience has to take into account the interaction of sound waves with the human body, with every convolution of the pinna and the head, the torso, the head width, to create that, the, the filter that we each have, a very bespoke filter um, that we call our head-related transfer function, the HRTF. And, you know, to date, most headphone solutions on the market provide a single HRTF that supports the population making the assumption that that bespoke filter that we each have is not what matters, but that we all look the same. And we just don't. We come in lots of shapes and sizes. We come and every one of them is beautiful. And the, the question becomes, I'm, I'm number three, four, five. I don't know if you can tell that, those of you who know me. But, <laughs> um, uh, but what's happened, you know, that I think is important is you know, we, we look for, is it good enough? Or we often look for, does this support a lot of the population? So when I look at something like, what experience are people having? And I see something like this. So let me give you an example. Here, here are four subjects. Each subject is hearing the exact same headphones, exact same renderers, exact same content. And they're being asked in this case to localize sources. And I'll tell you, localization is just not the, the most important part. It's also timbre, cognitive load, fatigue, all sorts of things factor into when we don't get that personalized experience right. So in this case, each teal dot represents where they should hear, um, should be hearing uh, a particular uh, source. Now, getting it right is, is just one of the questions, but when you see data like this, which is complete heterogeneity across a user group, right? I have four, you have four subjects here. And imagine you're, these are polar plots, so you're looking down on them. Um, their head would be pointed towards the, the front teal dot. You're seeing failure of the experience in very different ways. That means it's not predictable. And it means that you, know, you can't solve it with a transformation. And that's what's a problem. So you've got a, si a situation where here, you've got um, you know, either head complete collapse in the front region for one subject, You've got front back confusions for two of the subjects. So things that should be in front of them are perceived completely behind them. You've got 
localization errors for some subjects where things that should be at a particular location are off by say 20, 30 degrees. But then you also have changes in the perceived central, perceived uh, width of the source, which has very different impact. Is they may experience the center, the, the like if you just did a task to identify where they localize something, they may do just fine. But guess what? They're going to have major issues in cognitive fatigue and timbre and, and hearing um, sounds because they're going to have a lot of masking issues appear because the width of those sources is going to lead to like perceptual overlap and they're not going to be hearing what they should be from a creator's intent. And it, it just becomes a, a, a problem for the, on the side of creation if we're trying to transmit what the right answers are. So this on its own is, you know, a broken, broken, uh, a current, a broken system, but it gets even more concerning when you look at data like this. So if I take, um, you know, I think people are familiar with HRTS and I take, um, I, I believe this is the, partly the CIPIC database, but I think it's about 60 HRTS and we uh, do a principal components analysis on it, a simple way of pulling, you know, because the HRTFs vary among, you know, across on, on many different dimensions. So we're just going to pull out the two axes of highest variance and plot those, and then we're going to color code it by gender, okay? So when we do that, this is what we see, <laughs> which is if you look at HRTF in the magnitude space, it's almost linearly separable by sex. And that is, that is, you know, that's a problem. And you can look at similar things with ethnicity. So what that means is, you know, right now in most of the market, what is in the market is, is um, and look, if you look at the teal dots, imagine an exemplar um, mm -hmm. taken from right around the middle of those teal dots. So the rest of the population is, is not being supported. And that can mean an entire demographic. So, and not, you know, this just happens to be looking at sex, but you can look at other demographics and see similar patterns. I, the, the, if things were interspersed more, it would be a different question, but it's not. And it's because we are different and our technology needs to take that information into account as it you know, knows whether or not it's actually succeeding for us in delivering us the experiences and providing us the, the either the creative experience that was intended or the technological gain and capacity that was intended by what that experience is supposed to be doing for us to enable us to be faster, more reactive, maybe in a gaming environment or, you know, be a pilot in a, in a, in a cockpit trying to, to be as effective as a, another demographic. Now, the things that have changed when I said that, you know, where technology is, there's a lot of parallel advances. People have been talking about personalized and HRTFs in this community for many years. And, you know, and I think you know, we've moved past having to put somebody in an anechoic chamber where they sit for a day or however long with, you know, microphones in their ears to, to being able to, you know, at least my teams, we can create in less than a minute, a fully generative HRTF that's of higher quality than an anechoic HR, anechoic major, anechoically measured HRTF. And we aren't the only people who think about this problem and have created solutions for it. But the things that have happened is the parallel advances in technology that we can start adopting into our way of thinking about how, what we set as a bar for an, a good enough experience and how we think about who we support. Because it isn't just one demographic. It has to be all them and it has to be a broader demographics and knowing where things break down. But advances in cameras, advances in you know, the ability to have a lot of the computational um, uh, complexity happening in the cloud, things with um, computer vision techniques that can run rapidly in neural nets. Yeah, we've moved from these things being you know, one shot or living in academic labs to being scalable solutions for every consumer device because we can go from being in anechoic spaces to on mobile devices, creating things that support broad demographics and individuals. Now, that was just one example, but there are so many places where we need to reframe and, and think about what it means to support everyone in, uh, in a personalized manner that allows the technology to be supporting our goals and our needs in our environments and with our biological capacity and with our intent at that moment in time. So I'm going to now move to sort of, that was an example of how one size fits all technology can be a thing of the past. And I think you're, you're seeing a lot of transformations happen in that space. And I'm really grateful because I, I'm excited to finally have headphone experiences that are, <laughs> don't, that are, are leading us in good directions. So um, 
getting that personalized content, personalized delivery right is so important. But it's one of the pieces of how do you know you've gotten it right? So we can personalize our technology. But on Monday's talk and Monday's panel, the question came up, and this is what the, most of the rest of what I want to talk about is going to be about, is, okay, well, how do I know? How do I know whether I've, I've actually achieved the right experience, right? Is this, you know, consumer report or is this individual report? Or is this something that my technology can know about me, be partnered with me? and reading my uh, you know, amalgamated senses, because there have been a lot of shifts in proliferation of sensors paired with you know, machine learning and AI, help us be able to know much more about an individual and their intent and state in ways that technology can make use of. And that's where then, the, you know, for example, in the headphone experience, uh, if I am in you know, getting localization right, having parity of experience across every individual becomes so critical in augmented reality, not just for localization, but for cognitive effort, for setting mm -hmm. people on the same, uh, same baseline in terms of how they interact with that ancillary channel of audio information that should be augmenting my capacity as a human, my capacity in my work environment, in my gaming environment, in my, uh, in my entertainment environment. But if I can pick up on cognitive load, if I can pick up on cognitive effort, I can read these things through other um, sensory, sensory um, <clears throat> uh, sensors and uh, sensory channels. I can pick up whether it's successful or not. And I'll give a few examples of this as we go forward. Now, for, ex for instance, our voice is one of these sensory channels we get, one of the uh, signatures that we give off that we know tells us much more than, it, than we used to think it did. Uh, in the last 10 years, uh, groups have been able to identify that uh, the dynamics, the statistical dynamics uh, paired with um, AI in like, things like semantic coherence, syntactic complexity, are enable, uh, enable us to identify um, pathological condition like uh, a schizophrenia or the likelihood of psychosis within five years. Um, that's looking at the dynamics of how someone talks. Our voice is much richer, uh, gives much richer insight to our mental state and well-being than we ever thought it did. Uh, I've gone through a lot of papers, and, and I, if you look at the uh, signatures of Alzheimer's and dementia, Alzheimer's can show up with certain types of uh, temporal, uh, temporal uh, gap modifications, changes in pronoun usage, changes in how someone interacts with uh, uh, their particular <coughs> uh, certain content in, in their speech that can be quantified objectively. It's not what they're saying, but how they're saying it very often. It's the temporal dynamics of, of their speech that can show up sometimes 10 years ahead of a typical clinical diagnosis. Uh, multiple sclerosis, bipolar disorder, all have uh, you know, sonic signatures in voice patterns. Uh, diabetes, heart disease, uh, for this community especially, you know, you've got signatures that show up in certain spectral uh, regions, uh, things like diabetes, diabetes partly due to uh, the dehydration that happens in our bodies um, with when someone has diabetes, it can be picked up in the audio, you know, in, in the voice signature. Um, also heart disease, again, it's the uh, certain what they call what, what is referred to often as a sort of flutter or a, a um, jitter, a shimmery jitter, but it's really you know modulation that's showing up in certain frequency bands, and you can pick that up if you look at it. Uh, Parkinson's in, and even interpersonal health. In the case of interpersonal health, psychologists have been able to predict the likelihood of uh, 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 a couple staying together, either staying together or the cessation of their relationship just based on the dynamic patterns of their vocal production and their interchange. And we all know in this case, it's, it's never what you say, but always how you say it. And that's what's so powerful about these sorts of, um, uh, this sort of content is it's, it's not about the semantic, in, you know, semantic anchoring of what people are saying, it's how we say it. Uh, there are a number of groups that are able to detect, um, you know, from looking at uh, voice det you know, detection of COVID in the voice. And those have been, those types of metrics have been fairly successful 
you know, it's a different thing to get something standardized and, and turned into an actual test of, uh, you know, a particular illness or pathological condition. But again, the information's there. You know, our voice is much more powerful and, you know, devices that we have in our homes, obviously from, you know, many of your companies can tell us this information. Um, <clears throat> so when we think about that, the role of our vocal patterns and, you know, how it's changing our lives, it's suddenly not just, you know, it, it, it's, it's not just our mental and physical wellness, because here's this situation where we're in an unprecedented time. Devices around us and, you know, can, but we can know for the, you know, in a, in a, in a way that we've never been able to, we have longitudinal data about ourselves. Now, in this case, I'm talking about mental and physical health, but this goes further, right? Is this longitudinal data is, you know, unprecedented and it's extremely powerful because, you know, on the medical side, it, you know, the consumer health merge that's happening, you know, obviously is taking to a place where, um, you know, the, the, the places where our medical information, you know, is most known, the, the, the players in that are definitely changing, but the power comes in, you know, having this longitudinal data about ourselves that's so impactful means, you know, we can have democratized diagnostics where the, you know, the opportunity for intervention is so much higher than it used to be because there are treatments or, you know, there is a benefit to early diagnosis. And this is, can be democratized because the cost is low. You have situations where um, you have democratized impact for personalized medicine at lower cost. And that is really powerful in many situations. Obviously, telemedicine, places where, you know, the world we're in now, you want to enrich the information individuals have and empower them. But, and that becomes a, a, a really critical transformation in what we do and how we think. So uh, that unprecedented data that now is there, where something like heart disease or diabetes showing up in the voice would never have been found by one clinical visit to, to a physician or clinician. But because that data set lives with that individual, it is suddenly very, um, it, it's something that can be detected much earlier. So it is supporting a role that didn't ha we didn't have. So now I want to move to a couple other places where the signatures we give off can enable our technology to interact with us in different ways. The voice is one I think we're all familiar with, but our breath, you, <laughs> this is, we're in a virtual environment right now, but in, you know, when we're in a, in the same spaces and in proximal distance to each other, um, something we should re we all need to realize is you know, right? <laughs> I I recognize that this image has a, a different meaning today because of everything that's going on, um, but just we actually also independent of everything else that we um, exhale, we exhale a, a chemical composition of our emotions. That, that are changing dynamically. Uh, carbon dioxide, acetone, isoprene, uh, the dynamic, they change when your heart speeds up, when your muscles tense, in reaction to different uh, you know, stimuli that you're watching or feeling. And that can be measured volumetrically in spaces. For example, um, you know, this is, if any of you have seen the film Free Solo, uh, this is a capture uh, that my team did uh, of an audience uh, watching Free Solo, we worked with the filmmakers, everyone was aware they were going to be measured. Uh, we never do this without uh, consent. Um, it, and what we have here is, I mean, carbon dioxide is heavier than air, so you can actually just have tubes in the, on, the, on the ground and measure the real-time uh, density of CO2. And this is what, to me, this is a really beautiful capture. I didn't, I wasn't there the, when they did this capture, and I came back and it wasn't annotated. And I just saw the upper, so the upper trace is uh, CO2 of the audience. And what's beautiful about it is you can see the storyline, right? You can see in the car CO2 of, you can see where, if, any, if anyone hasn't seen Free Solo, it's, um, the, it won the documentary last year for best, um, uh, for the Academy Award. <clears throat> and it's about Alex Honnold, who uh, is a, an incredible rock climber who, who um, climbs without ropes, uh, you know, holds, I believe, still holds the record for, you know, fastest ascent of the nose. Um, and 
you know, on El Cap, and he also just, you know, he, he's uh, a very unique individual. Anyhow, in this film, he, you know, you can see just in the CO2 of the audience, when he summits, when he abandons a particular climb, you can see the love story. You can see where his ankle gets hurt when you look at the trace and then you annotate it. It's, it's all there. And that, that's really beautiful because for me, when we're looking for what does it mean to translate creative intent? Yeah, and for, for this is like, you can see the story, the audience going on the story, you know, following the storyline of the creator just in the breadth of the volumetric space which is incredibly beautiful. And then, you know, you, I mean, you might ask, well, does this hold up? Is this just one trace? You know, this is one audience. But uh, here's another group that I, I really like. Uh, they did, uh, this is five different audiences looking at the CO2 uh, trace across five different audiences. And you've got, um, to, to watching the Hunger Games, different times of day, different, you know, ages. And what's beautiful is clearly, I think we all see that the CO2 trace is pretty consistent across these groups. If you zoom in, you can actually see where Katniss's dress catches on fire. So we broadcast our emotions and we broadcast them in ways that we don't always think about, that we share and exchange. Um, so I like to say then, are we capturing the right dimensions to preserve and transmit the intent of the creator? Like, what does that mean? How do we know we are? And the same goes for our technology. If I create a technology that's supposed to enhance someone, enable them in a particular way, how do we assure that that's really where it's, where it's going? So technology is closing the loop between ourselves and the environments where we tell and consume our stories. So, so what do we do about that? And how do we react? What do we build? Um, I like to, <coughs> yeah, so, so we, our voice, our breath gives off, you know, we're giving off these signatures about our internal state uh, in our environments, but it's always, I think, good to look at the fact that other species have been do, do this all the time. In fact, they do it in ways that are really quite beautiful, where you can see their internal biology. You, you basically get this window that's quite beautiful to their internal biology and its reaction, its deterministic reactions with the world, um, you know, where evolutionary pressures are driving them. Uh, so, for example, this is a video I'm going to play. Uh, this is me. Uh, bear with me for a moment. I'm a violinist, not a singer, but this is a spider in my garden. And um, it, this may work for some of you. For some of you, you might not be able to, to see it, but just take a listen. There's a little delay there, but hopefully it worked. Okay, um, it, which yeah, it, it turns out some spiders tune their webs like violin to resonate like violins, and likely as my voice went higher, the harmonics coupled with the change in intensity caused the spider to do what it should. It told me to bug off, right? <laughs> and, uh, it's yeah, but it's this beautiful thing where biology is responding to the external world and giving me this beautiful peek into its internal one, right? And as humans, we like to think we keep our cognitive states to ourselves, we keep our poker face, and that we're different than that spider. But, you know, I gave you a few examples already. Our, you know, our breath is broadcasting our emotions, but there are other ways where we're constantly giving off our experiences. So let me just give another example now. So there's that spider. Well, I want you to pay attention to the diameter of the pupil in this eye um, as I play uh, the next piece, because... You know, our autonomic nervous system, you know, what I'm about to show you is, uh, you know, it, it, the diameter change in the pupil is driven entirely by mental effort. And I want you to try to understand the two talkers. Uh, it'll be hard at first because they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're two and they're, they should be um, overlapped, but one will drop out, should get very easy because there will be one talker. And you'll see the change in the diameter of the pupil. If you're trying to do the same thing, your pupil is, uh, uh, if you're trying to understand the talkers, your pupil will be doing, the, should be doing the same thing as the, the subject in the lab. Um, and I want you to just listen. So. Intelligent technology depends on personal data. Intelligent technology depends on personal data. Intelligent Today's technology, technology depends, depends on, on personal data. data. Intelligent technology depends on personal data. Okay, so did that work for everyone? Good. Okay, 
So our autonomic nervous system is driving our pupil to dilate uh, when, when our brain is having, uh, having to work harder. And you know, there are three different things that will drive your pupil to dilate. Right? And this is where it's transformative in where we are today than where we were 10 years ago. Um, your pupil will dilate, I think we all know, because of lighting changes. We know our pupil will dilate. So changes in lighting, that's well known. Uh, pupillometries that we've been using in academics and labs for more than 50 years, uh, where uh, you, can, you can detect, one moment please, where you can detect changes in cognitive effort and you can measure things like an audiogram or even a mismatch, uh, a minimum audible angle just by the change in diameter of the pupil. Uh, for for many different species, but so mental effort will drive your pupil to dilate, but so will engagement, right? So you have three different things. Uh, 10, 15 years ago, to capture the type of data we needed cost $15,000 or so in a lab. Um, today, that's just going, you know, that you're looking at dollars, uh, you're looking at integration into every pair of smart glasses that you know, we will be wearing or people will be wearing in the next few years. Suddenly you have this channel of human, uh, channel to human insight. And again, it's that unprecedented longitudinal data that suddenly becomes so powerful to optimize my technology, but also gain new information about me, right? So if I have, you, and you pair, you have an ambiguous signal that could be driving that dilation from three different areas, but now you pair it with a microphone, right? The minute you have a microphone, you have intelligence to the, the environment, you have intelligence to what is happening that lets you disambiguate um, d disambiguate that as well as you probably have a sensor that's detecting whether you know lighting has has changed but that all of those things can live on a pair of glasses or in our environments in some way so the proliferation of sensors in machine learning has suddenly taken these signatures that were interesting somewhat ambiguous but not particularly useful outside a lab made them extremely cost efficient ex extremely scalable and also disambiguated what the meaning is so that they can become a critical part or critical a platform of data of about the individual to drive their technology experiences as well as their engagements. Um, and I think that's that's a huge transformation that we're going to see. Um, the eye intersection of the eye with the ear with our environments. And I you know, when when I think about that, there's uh, in terms of, you know, you can even think about health, health conditions where you know, just having diameter of pupil paired with a microphone, you can detect things like um, uh, early dementia, right? Or because you can know when certain questions, certain content is causing increase in cognitive load, you pairing, you know, the microphone input, some of that with a shift in pupil diameter, because now you have two different metrics to join that intersection. All right. Now, other things, Does anyone have a guess? Okay, so watching something like a penalty kick or you know, watching a, a soccer match, I can look at what's called galvanic skin response and perfectly predict everywhere there was a penalty kick during that match. Now, GSR is used, you know, it's basically a lie detector test, right? But it's, it's picking up small changes in the conductance of someone's skin. These types of, you know, and you might look at this initially and go, gee, that, that doesn't look very, uh, 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 predictive, but then when you actually plot every penalty kick, it's that human anticipation. This happens to be a, a plot from an individual that doesn't watch football or soccer, but there is that anticipation of these events that you can't turn off. Same thing that when we walk into a job interview, same thing when you're a performance athlete or in, in any sort of sport or game environment, that anticipation that's driven by our physiological responses it's there. And these things, again, used to live in labs. They're moving into our watches. They're moving into our ears. We can pick these, this type of information up. It becomes part of a platform of engagement. So then it becomes, how do we use it? How do we use it for the individual to enhance, augment, and you know, modulate their experience in a way that they will perform better, or they will behave in the way that they want to see? Um, the, our bodies radiate our stories in many cases. We, use, we can look at thermal images and detect, if you look at the derivative or dynamics of the thermal image around the face, you, you can see things to, you can see. Is everyone able to see a thermal image? I just got to notice that I lost a connection to the server. I want to make sure you're still seeing me. No. Oh yes, we do, no. Okay, no one's seeing the thermal image. Okay, I'm gonna try again.
Okay, I'm connected. Are we Poppy, seeing? I think I think perhaps we should reset the space. Um, uh, I'm still seeing the galvanic skin response slide. Oh, there okay. we go. So I'm Is seeing that now. I'm Are seeing, seeing it. it? I'm not sure whatever. Yeah. Okay, I think uh, it's on my side. I, I. Okay. I think we're good in the uh, in the audience. Okay. Just okay. Great. Everyone. Great. So. Yeah, the thermal dynamics of our bodies are become, again, this is, uh, we can, you know, stress, cognitive effort can all be picked up in dynamics of the thermal image because your body is radiating these stories. I mean, you can imagine in, you know, again, I don't think any of us want to look at a thermal image and try to deduce what we should do with a, you know, highly dimensional set data set, but it's what you extract from it. How do you use that knowledge and you, you know, apply the right dimensionality reduction and transformation, all that rich data set that we know is informative to you know, translate something that would be informative? Is it a new form of interpersonal communication? You know, can, can it be the word for through an AR um, exchange? Uh, there are a lot of different places. So. I like to say it's the end of the purple phase, but um, maybe. <laughs> but let's instead call it the era of the empath, right? And where that gets us is, uh, you know, thinking about what does it mean we, you know, to know more for our technology to know more about us in, in a way that you know, em empathetic technology. It's not trying to emote with me. It's trying to amalgamate and use information about my internal state to enhance my experience to modify the the interaction I'm having with technology so that technology is better supporting my uh, success in that environment or with that device. Um, I like to say we will have a dynamic relationship with the spaces where we work, train, travel, and live. Now, this is, you know, to me, a really important one because we're now even in our home and virtual environments or if we're in our work environments, but this is an information of sensors in our spaces and how those spaces are dynamically interacting with us, whether it's through sound, smell, light, lighting, skins, can be very powerful. Um, now, I say an ironic re reality where incre increased tracking and ubiquitous sensing can mean greater autonomy and freedom. So you may not, many of you, I don't, some of you may be aware, but maybe not all, uh, there, um, Aging in place is a, a really important uh, direction of technology for the, the, the future, and there's uh, companies looking at these areas. But the, the idea is, you know, and, and especially with the pandemic, it, it really highlights how important it is to enable people to be empowered and autonomous in their homes instead of, you know, having to go to care facilities that may be very costly and such. And, you know, it, through amalgamated sensing that tracks an individual, for a caregiver, for someone on the other other side, it can enable someone to stay in their homes maybe 10 years longer with you know an increased quality of life, increased sense of well-being. Where it's not just tracking whether someone you know takes a pill or not, but it's also tracking human uh, the, the the human state and whether someone is depressed or whether someone is in need of human connection or, or how well their quality of life is going. There is um, a lot that can be done in these areas. Uh, you can measure heart rate through Wi-Fi, right? You can measure a lot of information. It also opens up the opportunity for, you know, we, we often have pharmacological interventions that are, you know, tracked on, you know, a six-week timeline, you know, goes to your doctor and by then mental state has deteriorated or something has not been modified. So you get much more uh, insight to um, a real-time modification that can be done to know if something is failing or something succeeding. So there are a lot of uh, directions. I've seen cable companies who you know, really were cable companies shift towards you know, focus on aging in place for their demographics. And um, you, there's a lot of interesting work being done by many companies to try to in, enhance uh, the capacity of this. And it, again, it, it really is important in the pandemic where we've seen a lot of, uh, not, a lot of difficulty of uh, care facilities in terms of uh, protecting the individuals. Now, I think this is maybe everyone in this invite, this audience is, will agree with me on this, unlike many audiences where, you know, people often say the eye, eye is the window to the soul, but by all means, I believe it is the ear, and they've been definitely got that one wrong. So the ear is this remarkable place where it is, uh, because we can talk about how our spaces interact with us, but the question is, how do we build that bridge between the, the individual human and now the space and the technology? And I believe the ear is where that can happen. So, you know, the ear is the window to the soul. It's by far the be the, the fastest uh, place to both read and write the brain. 
Um, you might call it a USB port between the body, emotions, and external world. Uh, just within your cruncha, there, you know, about a dime-sized patch of skin, you can, there's like a, bi I like, it's like a biological cacophony of <laughs> signatures that we can pick up on uh, that can be amalgamated and used to enrich our experiences. So it's things we can read from inside the ear. We can you know, identify, and this is, academic groups have done this. It's, it's really beautiful work where you can neurally decode a particular talker, you know, in a, you know, in a sort of cocktail party environment. Uh, because you, and again, this is we, signatures we can pick up on are things like EEG. We can pick up EEG in the ear. And so through that and uh, specific transformations, you can uh, decode where talk, which talker someone might be pay, uh, attending to where they are, say someone, someone's eyes are directed in front of them, but they're listening behind them. Like, I mean, their, their attention is directed behind them. You could pick that up from a sensor in the ear. Gaze direction, right? Uh, definitely can pick up electrooculograms and things. We've built headphones that do this where, uh, or earbuds, where just looking uh, when someone's eye is directed uh, in a particular uh, position, especially along azimuth, along the horizontal plane, it creates, you know, you can pick up the electrical signal called an electrooculogram. Uh, because of the, the electrical signal that's produced from the different uh, the differential from the front back of the retina as the eye moves, uh, you pick that up in the ear, right? So somebody, you don't need an eye tracker for a lot of information. It's it's fairly accurate, and on you know again, it's you know, what are you trying to do with that information, and how coarse can it be, or how you know how can you use that to improve the experience? Uh, mental gestures, you know, differences in sort of thought patterns from within the ear. Again, that's using EEG. Uh, cognitive load through GSR. Uh, stress you can pick up through different transformations of the EEG signal, but also through uh, chemical uh, capture. Scene awareness, mental health. Well, you have a microphone on the ear, and suddenly, you know, we know that we can pick up scene awareness through uh, different uh, uh, transfer, uh, different machine learning and all that um, captures, but also uh, mental health, many of the different conditions that I laid out earlier, again, can be captured in the ear, uh, because as long as you have a microphone and appropriate processing. A uh, galvanic skin response, and then vagal nerve plasticity. So I said the ear is an amazing, you know, the most amazing place to read and write the brain, or most efficient way, place. Let's, I like to use the word amazing, but it's probably a little, <laughs> a little too much. Um, so your vagal nerve is, you know, Methods, when you stimulate your vagal nerve, it bootstraps your, plast your neuroplasticity system. It, it like bootstraps your cholinergic receptors, your, your cholinergic neurotransmitters and, and muscarinic receptors. And, and this is like a critical part of information that you receive within a time window around that stimulation will be enhanced, right? Will be enhanced in the learning process. So it's this opportunity and you can stimulate it. You know, often it's done with a, an implant in, you know, in directly in the body, but you can actually stimulate it in the air. And that's, you know, there, there are a number of labs in, in, in uh, medical facilities that are looking at that because it's also mm -hmm. one of the more successful treatments for tinnitus. And um, it's, it becomes this opportunity to think a lot about plasticity and, and rewriting the brain in ways that we want to see or we want to target. Um, there's a, I have a paper in IEEE, you can take a look at it if you want to see, because I, I lay out a lot of these different uh, different uh, options, but uh, things that can be done. But I do believe, you know, in five years, we're going to wear earbuds or things that talk, listen uh, to our, we're going to wear uh, devices in our ears more to listen to our body and interact with our technology than just to play us music. And we need to think about what that means because that can enhance our image. It can enhance all of our immersive experiences in very rich ways because it's such a rich uh, um, and personal uh, capture of our internal state. All right. Um, does everyone see? I don't know if everyone's seeing the right information right now. I don't. Uh, do you see the ear? Let's see. No, you don't. Okay. I'm trying to fix this and then I will. I'm almost done. Da, 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 da. Looking for problems. I, what, what's happening is uh, I think we have. Do 
you know what I think would be easiest? I only have a couple slides left. I don't know, Larry, are you, are you able to control my slides for me? Uh, I should be. Uh, just give me just a moment. And uh, I've got, let me see if I can advance them. Yeah, why don't you do that? Because I've got um, well, I'll give two, it a try. multiple okay. laptops. I, I think it's, it's the laptop that's controlling my slides that is going offline okay. and having an issue. So, so I'm trying. There, um, did everybody? Oh, yeah, that worked. So Do you see um, what we can learn from the ear? What we yes. See? Sure. Yeah, I got it. So just tell me when you want to advance to the next slide. Perfect. So, yeah, so this is, uh, you can find that. And, uh, you know, this is the idea that there are, you know, a number of mental states and, you know, different types of information that we can be picking up in the air, I think. Um, and, you know, probably easiest thing, if you want to take a look, you can, there's a spectrum article that you can find and, and it goes through it. But, so, we talk about the importance of, you know, the interaction of technology with our, the signatures we give off in the environment and how those can all intersect with our bodies, internal, our internal states. The last thing I sort of want to leave with is, is this. So, um, uh, can you slide? <laughs> Are you on marmosets, monkeys, everybody see monkeys? Okay, great. All right. So, um, well, a species I worked with, with many, I've worked with a lot of different species, and one of the species I worked with for many years is, is called, is the common marmoset. And marmosets are um, very, they're, they're amazing creatures, but they're very unique in some ways. So, uh, yeah, they're, they are an arboreal uh, New World primate that's native to Brazil, lives in the Amazon, and their, their quality of life and well-being is highly dependent on their social interactions with um, their colony, with the others in their social group. Um, except for it's this real problem, because guess what? They, they live in trees and with dense foliage, and they can't really see each other at all. And, and that poses a problem on its own. So evolution has done these beautiful things where, you know, if you go to Asia, you go to China, you go to places where, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of uh, old world primates are very visual in their interactions with each other. They make faces. You would see me making faces right now if you were here, but you're not in my living room, so you can imagine. But they, they definitely emote that way. Marmosets are like these stoic little creatures. They like never like show you their emotions. They do not wear anything on their shirts. And but what is beautiful is instead they have these mellifluous uh, vocalizations where like you can interact with them, you can understand you know, what their mental or internal state is through obviously through their vocalizations, a lot more like, you know, in some type, cases like humans, but ways of communicating given the constraints of their environment, right? Which is how we all adapt and we all have to be unique and malleable. But um, they also have these incredible pheromonal systems, which is not true for many mammals, especially primates. So the dominant female in a, in a colony secretes pheromones that causes all the other females' uh, biology to alter, just based on her mental state. Pretty crazy. And you can take a different female out, uh, put her in similar proximity, but now with a different role, uh, where she's now the dominant female, and her biology will change just based on her mental state and start affecting all the other females in her colony, her social group. And it's really powerful. Now, I'm not talking about human pheromones, but, uh, slide, uh, but what, everybody see the two human, okay, do we see, yeah, good, okay, what I think we need to always recognize is, you know, it's like the non-overt forms of communication are very powerful, and, you know, I, I talked about how the breath we exchange has, you know, changes that reflect our emotions. That's the air when we're in common proximity and spaces that we all breathe and we all interact with. Um, one of the, you know, some, some, some of uh, my team has looked at uh, what is the role of just being in the same proximity and experiencing a high emotional valence content, right? Like when we're just in the same space versus when we're by ourselves. And the reason I bring this up is I'm going to show you what I think is very interesting data, but now that we're virtual, I, it kind of sets a bar for what I think we should be striving for in our virtual exchanges and experiences. Um, so what I'll show, let, let's watch the next video. And I'm going to tell you, you're going to see two things. And I'm just going to, I, I cut these videos down to literally loop just a few seconds for, for reasons of, of you know, not wanting to distribute content. Um, but that, what, what we've done is have, we, these were actually longer videos captured where the same individual is watching a piece of content alone or they're watching it in larger in proximity of others, not talking, not moving. Um, these are 
extractions of the EEG signature. So everyone's being measured on EEG on galvanic skin response as well. And you're seeing not um, engagement, not the strength of the EEG signature, EEG signature the electroencephalogram, but you're seeing the um, uh, neural correlation. So this is intersubject correlation. And this is literally looking at how synchronized their brains are when they are watching this content. And the thing I want you to see just in these short loops is you'll see like on the left is the intersubject correlation watching the content and it's all normalized but watching the content for alone versus when they're together and you're going to see like a shift in the the growth of the um the, the diameter of the uh circle uh when the sort of most highly high valence section happens okay so let's watch the first one and then we can go right to the second one they are long dead They are long dead. They are long dead. Okay, and the next is There you go. Uh, Poppy, I moved on to the next one because that last video, um, that's all I had. Hello? Can you hear me? Excellent. Okay. <laughs> all right. And okay. Look. So I don't know if you saw the second video, but the idea is, um, sorry, I'm just going to turn around here. Emotions like fear, disgust. So the first is obviously disgust. The second was fear um, in the chase scene. Uh, when those high valence emotions happen, you can see it in the people feel together. The neural synchrony that happens by being in the same proximity is, is present. These are all based on non-overt communication. Right? So how do we think about enhancing that as we, in our virtual worlds? I think we're just starting to understand that this happens in our physical world, right? We, you know, and, and we're starting to realize that that's such a human component of how we interact. It's not just about, I mean, you really can be the life of the party without even trying, right? And yeah, you know, it these states, it has implications on healthcare and how you partner people in rooms, or it has implications on workforce where, you know, you can have someone who's very unhappy in a work environment and, and doesn't speak up, but the mental state is affecting, impacting everyone around it. You start to think about the virtual environments of how do we um, look at this type of communication and think about how we enhance and, and leverage um, this as a baseline. All right, so uh, next slide, and we will, because we need to finish, I just want to jump to the last, next, next. Um, uh, yes, I'm going to say this, and then we're last slide, and then we go. All right, so the last thing I want to leave you with is when we advance human capacity, and we do it in ways that are transformative, there are three pillars I think we always need to think about. So if you think about the X Games, and what, you know, you, you look at what people can do. We make people fly with snowboards. We make people do things that they never could do before. And it's not just because of technological advance, right? That's part of it. Like, you know, changes in uh, material composition, changes in the, you know, the, the cut, the, 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 the formulation of the board so that it allows someone to cut in certain ways to, to be airborne in other ways because of the, 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 the weight and, and how it performs in, in certain environments. That's one pillar, but technology is only one. The other is an understanding of neuroplasticity and human interaction that happens because of the way the individual can, the, the trainers, the, 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 the coaches, and how they know to work with that technology with the athlete, to help them leverage it as much as possible and retrain their brains so that they can become, and they, they are able to do things that no human has been able to do before. And that, that's the neuroplasticity component. And then there's the third pillar. And that third pillar is a completely parallel pillar that's happened that's allowed us to make people fly. And that is advances slide in the medical industry where 
the cost and risk of breaking an arm has completely changed, right? So now people engage in different ways and they use that technology in ways they would never have used it before. So where are we today? We have those, we have, tech, we have technological advances and an understanding of neuroplasticity and let us be completely transformed in who we are, how we become, what we become. The, that third pillar I think is what we do with data privacy and ethics around this technology um, and how engaged we are with making and enabling this to be proliferate in ways it should that will help us um, in, in, and how we define you know, the right legislation, right standards around these types of things. Because without that, we will not get the benefits of the technology. Um, all right, so go, uh, let me see, slide. Uh, uh, slide, all right, because I know we gotta move. So the last thing I can say is, uh, to know thyself is the beginning of wisdom. So technology is gonna make us know more about us than we know ourselves. Can we make this the beginning of a new relationship between the creator and the audience, which is each of us. So thank you. Thank you, Poppy. I think we do have time for a few questions before we move over to the panel room. Great. All right, you'll see the raise hand icon on the right side of your screen. Do I click on it or does somebody else click on it? Okay. Anyone else that, uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. I heard a feedback, so I think you can hear me. Can hear um, you, definitely. Okay, I can hi. See... Okay, cool. Hi, hi, Bobby. It's it's a pleasure. Thanks for such an interesting uh, presentation. Um, I'm I'm doing some research with ASMR and ASMR inducing media. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm really interested in in how we can apply. Um, immersive technologies or uh, like media in general uh, for health, especially mental health. Um, mm -hmm. I'm just like, um, obviously in a, in a utopic or in a dream world, we want to offer um, like these health benefits or this um, health care for, for everyone. You were mentioning in your presentation um, how not marketable um, some stuff is and how like the system works so how how can we kind of reflect um how can i formulate this how can we shape um uh, these technologies so we can offer this to a wider demographics how can we uh, stop like being so elitist um with like uh, yeah like the offer of technology because like it like I, it feels that we're just like dragging the same old same benefits for some, only some some people um what what do you think is the best route to kind of widen the the offer for everyone and not only some privileged people um I, well i i think some of the things like especially in in healthcare and you know is it's you know, and we've created technology that was had a, a lot of bias in it because it was usually built for one, you know, built for European white males and no offense to anyone who is, you know, that's, that simply be, is often because the innovation, the companies that supported that were there. And, you know, and, and uh, it, we're in a place though where it's through machine learning and AI that we can actually remove as much as we talk about bias in AI, and we do always need to care about our training sets and data. It's through, through a machine learning and AI, we can actually think differently about what we build and who we disseminate it to and how we, um, you know, how, how we judge success of that dissemination to an individual and support to the individual in different um, uh, demographics. And, you know, it's, it's only through that algorithmic computation that we're able to, you know, scale 
scale these types of things. And so, you know, again, I, I'm seeing great opportunities where it's the longitudinal data that we can have of an individual or new methods of capturing personalization and engaging that in and defining it as not, oh, yeah, that's a nice to have. And is this good enough or is this compelling? But instead recognizing that it's going to break for certain people. And that's, you know, that's just not that's not OK. And that's not good enough. We need to think differently about the outliers. If we build for the outliers, we end up building for everybody quite well. And I think that's, you know, I'm not the first person to say that, but it does get us to a better state of te technology and human interaction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yes, hello, uh, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can. Yeah, yeah, I, I get, my question was, was very similar to the, to the last questioner, but uh, maybe I can and, uh, offer a different, uh, different examples. I mean, I, I believe that I will probably be able to afford the technology that you're talking about as, as, as long as uh, you mentioned it in the, near the end of your, your talk that uh, we need to be sure that the um, that things are turned in ways that are helpful to society rather than uh, having having a small group take it over and, and control it. But uh, you know, I, I assume that I'll be able to afford what you're talking about, but I know there are people who live 25 miles away from me who can't even uh, afford to buy uh, high-speed internet for their kids to zoom into uh, remote classes. And uh, I can't imagine how that that major uh, stratification in our society is, is going to allow all of us to to be able to communicate with each other. And, and I guess that's, it's it's similar to, to what was asked before, but-, but So it's interesting, those are great, that? those are great questions. I would say we have a broken system. This is a way to actually improve what you're asking about. Um, if you, I mean, like, again, a sim a, a, the, the first I start with, which is the voice. It, you know, diagnostics, um, health, you know, personalized medicine being driven by amalgamated sensing in the home um, or sensing on a device or through telemedicine, through the vocal interaction, you know, the vocal interactions of the individual providing, an, you know, that longitudinal data set that is lower cost than, you know, clinical visits. And it's much it, it is a much um, more. It's a way to also reach a lot of individuals that may not have, you know, technology because the, you know, specific technologies in their homes uh, it, that would have, you know, or even knowledge that they should reach out or they should see a clinic, a clinician or a physician. Um, I, I think there are a lot of opportunities here where it is, you know, it's only through this that you get democratization of benefits that are happening. Obviously, you can think about sort of this elitist, what's the net, you know, these are, we can do these you know, very transformative things that are specific to a user group focused on them and, you know, it comes at a higher cost. But I think there's a lot of information that is now going to be able to support people in ways they couldn't. Like if I think about autonomous aging, you know, that, that doesn't, that's not, you're, you're not looking at an elitist, you're, you're saving people money. Those people would be in going, you know, saving, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars in comparison to going into a care facility, instead enabling them to live in their home, keep their home, live on their own. And, um, you know, I think about earbuds that capture a lot of information, you know, yes, you, you're going to see, um, you know, that that's one line of, of technology that is you know going to become lower in cost as as we go forward, but um, it's also you know there are microphones are pretty inexpensive sensors when it comes down to it that can enable with the right processing very rich data sets to you know help inform uh, technological uh, modifications that support an individual. Well, thank you so much, Poppy, for this very wonderful, thoughtful, and inspiring Woo. keynote. Let's give Poppy another a round of uh, appreciation. Oh, no. and
<laughs> Thank you all. <laughs> We are just a little bit behind, and so we're going to go ahead and move over to the panels room. That's Avar Panels. Um, okay. And uh, we will go and set up there and see you ever, everyone there in a few minutes. Sorry, how do I drop this microphone? I also have like a text message in my face and I really don't know what I'm doing right now. Uh, you should be able to right click and drop the mic, Sally, I think. Right, okay, okay, good. <laughs> oh wait, I have this right click. I don't want that either. Okay, there we go. Nice, nice, okay, cool, yeah. Just, Excellent. Just one other reminder is that all of the panelists, um, if you would please just do one check to see that you're on air and you yeah. should be amplified with, with no problem in front of the microphone where you're sitting. So as long as everyone's on air, we can go ahead and start. Great. Yep. Just okay, everyone. Whoa. Hello. Can, yep. can we get Varun? some emojis? Yep. Varun, can we hear you? Varun? Hello. Yeah. And Poppy, can we hear you? Hi. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. 
Yeah, I think we got Wonderful. everybody, Sal. Excellent. We'll get we'll get kicking then. Uh, so, first of all, thank you, Poppy, so much for your fantastic keynote. I'm sure all of us had little, uh, quite a few different little like mind blowing moments where we're recontextualizing our understanding of both what audio means, uh, what audio could mean, what perception means, what perception could mean, and all those things. So here we have a panel of absolutely um, fantastic folks to reflect on the topic of this keynote. What we'll do to kick it off is we, we will actually go down the line and I'll have these wonderful um, panelists introduce themselves. Of course, Poppy, you're, you're right here. Um, do you want to say just a few words in case someone couldn't make your keynote? Uh, sure. Uh, so, so I'm Poppy Crum. I'm, I'm chief scientist at Dolby uh, Laboratories, and, and um, I'm adjunct professor at Stanford. Uh, my, I'm a neuroscientist, technologist. Uh, definitely like to look at experiences. Heavily focused on um, how we provide the the, the right, uh, t scalable, and technologically relevant and successful experience across many broad demographics. That was definitely the part of the topic um, from the past talk and on empathetic technology and thinking about scalable, uh, successful user experiences. Thanks. Stefania? Uh, hi, my name is uh, Stefania Serafim and uh, I'm professor at Tolbog University in Copenhagen. And uh, I lead a lab which we call Multisensory Experience Lab. And the reason why we call it like this is because uh, we are mostly focused on uh, developing both basic and applied research to sound, but we are also interested in seeing uh, how sound uh, complements uh, or uh, replaces or enhances other senses. And uh, uh, we have been working with virtual and augmented reality technologies for uh, about uh, 20 years now, but of course uh, lately with the democratization, the research in virtual and augmented reality has become uh, more relevant also for our lab. Varun? Hey, I'm, I'm Varun Nair. I lead our AR, VR, video software technology team at Facebook. I'm working on our audio capture algorithms, our digital audio technologies, our developer APIs, operating system service, basically the whole audio stack. Um, good to be here. Thank you, Brian. Hey, good to see you again, Varun. Um, I'm Brian Schmidt. Um, background is in music and sound for games. Uh, but I also studied uh, audio technology at my master's at Northwestern University uh, back in the 80s. And I was fortunate to study under uh, Professor Gary Kendall and his postdoc, uh, his doctor student, uh, Bill Martins, uh, who did one of the earliest implementations of HRTF based uh, digital sound simulation back when it. Uh, to generate 30 seconds of HRTF audio simulated for about a day and a half of compute time. Um, so recently, I'm also a, a lecturer here at DigiPen um, and uh, thrilled to be on the panel with everybody. Thank you, everyone. So um, I wanted to kick off this reflection on the keynote um, by actually throwing the virtual microphone over to Stefania. Now, Stefania, your lab deals deeply with multisensory experience. Uh, do you have um, any thoughts that you know might have popped up while Poppy was giving her perspective and her keynote about empathy and embodiment in the experience of our immersive audio spatialization um, industry and how that contributes to technology and user experience and how it relates to the work that you do right now? Yeah, first of all, I'd like to thank as well Poppy for the wonderful keynote with uh, lots of very interesting examples of uh, empathic technologies. I think in our lab, uh, we look at uh, uh, empathy in a different way in the sense that uh, we are more looking at uh, technologies to facilitate uh, empathy between uh, two individuals. So to give an example, uh, we use, uh, uh, lately we had a project uh, on using uh, a virtual reality to simulate the experience uh, of children with a cochlear implant so the parents can actually experience how their child hears the world around. So our uh, simulations, uh, they create uh, either some uh, technology deprivation or some technology enhancement uh, so other individuals uh, can uh, understand uh, what uh, a different population can experience. So it was very interesting uh, 
Poppy's uh, approach to use uh, like actually the empathy machine in a way is uh, the machine itself. Why for us the machine facilitates empathy between individuals? I found an interesting uh, um, small difference between the approaches. I, I don't think it's a difference. Um, sorry. I mean, it's we, we, we are very focused on the uniqueness in human perception and how we best facilitate that. But then the question is, get, so I, I really love what you're doing to in, you know, basically allow someone to walk in somebody else's shoes because it, it vastly changes how they engage. And we do a lot of work to look at that, um, where, you know, something as simple as a head related transfer function, having someone hear what the world might be like through someone else's ears or um, digit mobility in design of a U UX, uh, giving someone, you know, um, arthritis simulation gloves and having them uh, wear those for, you know, an hour and then design a UX to see if they modify and if they think differently about, you know, how they deal, you know, in insertion of a drop down menu, that's impossible if I have you know, some sort of, you know, digit mobility issue and things. So I, the, but then the question comes, well, how do you actually facilitate this into a technology that's supporting all of these individuals in ways, given that we know there's this empathetic, um, you know, you want to create empathy, but then translate that into an empathetic experience of the, you know, within the design of the technology. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And uh, another thing that uh, um, I was curious about is uh, so because I read some studies where they say that actually uh, personalization of HRTFs are not actually necessary in a virtual reality experience because of course we have uh, all the other stimuli, visual stimuli, motion, and so on. So I was interested to hear what the members of the panel thinks about that. I up in a discussion the other day, and I think it, it's uh, worth having back in. Uh, to me, it's always a, coming from a perspective of what the use cases are. There might be cases where we require highly accurate spatialization, and it, and it actually helps in use case. But in other cases, we, the, the visual stimuli or, or um, the acoustic modeling or propagation of sound or occlusion within, of sound within the space could end up having more creative value to um, to our um, to, to people experiencing um, the VR or AR experience or uh, whatever it is, um, so it, the ideal state is one where we can do really good simulations for everything. But uh, I, I think it largely comes down to what the trade-offs are. And, and to me, beyond a point, personalization helps, but um, the contextual way in which it's represented actually matters a lot more. So I mean. Yeah. Add, thank, thank you, Varun, again. So, so I actually think this is a gap in, in how we think in the industry, and it's part of why I put it up. Um, it, you know, from an auditory visual integration side, so I've been looking at auditory visual integration for, I don't know, 25 years, and um, you know, how our brain integrates this type of information. The, the thing with a lot of HRTF work that's been done is it looks at localization. Localization is Excellent. not the yeah. only parameter. Um, you have to care about, you know, if you have, like I said in my, my keynote, you can have um, wider source um, width, wider width, source width uh, perception across users. That leads to um, masking of certain elements because it's, it's perceptually represented that way in their brain. It, I mean, in their experience, which leads to not hearing certain elements or it leads to cognitive effort changes. It leads to timbral changes. In a VR environment, you've got you know, in front of you, you have the benefit of ventriloquism because you're going to pull out objects and, and you're going to have some localization around there, but you also then have, you know, objects behind you or you have the cog ventriloquism creates, uh, when your brain's having to work harder at mismatched sources, you get a shift in cognitive effort. That cognitive effort leads to um, slower reaction times. It leads to increased fatigue. It leads to, you know, getting a headache under certain environment. And, you know, you can say, well, okay, but it works for a lot of people and maybe for some it doesn't. The question is how well it works for different people, how much it's impacting these other dimensions of experience besides just localization. And then when you think about it's happening for certain demographics and not others, that's just like flat out not okay in my perspective. It's like we need to recognize that these things show up in different ways and it's a lot of localization studies, a lot of HRT studies are done with say single sources and, and the real effort comes when you have complex environments 
and pulling out the different environments. And it can, you know, sh show up in a deleterious um, way in a gaming environment where you are potentially um, benefiting one demographic and not another, or you're leading to more cognitive effort that's being allocated towards use, use of that spatial technology integrating, you know, in uh, with the, the visual um, uh, uh, co-registration that needs to happen in a way that doesn't benefit another demographic. And, and that cognitive effort, I think, is a real thing. And uh, again, I, you know, so to Varun, I'd have this, guy, this question to you. I think we're in a place where, you know, at least in, in my company, we can create a fully generative HRTF in less than a minute that's quite scalable. And um, I think other companies have, you know, their own methods that do things. And, you know, we are at a place where the scalability of doing it right is possible and it's there. So we have to actually care to implement it and to assure that these things exist. I think the so there's I mean, there's as much effort in figuring out a way in which we can generate these HRTFs quickly and in um, and ensure that they work really well. But it's just as much effort to surface this in products in a way that people can access it easily um, and and also see the value in doing so. Um, mm -hmm. And part of this is also how we collect the data, what we do with it. Um, and building up that trust for people as well. Um, so, for if if I am putting on a VR headset uh, and if I need to say scan my ear, or take a photograph, or maybe there are other techniques as well, uh, what are the trade-offs there? Are are people going to put in the time and effort to do so? And how can we how can we show them that there's value in that as well? Um, those are the bits that I think, or the dimensions that we can and should increasingly pay attention to as we try and roll this out at scale. Um, because we've got people who want to put on a headset and go for it, um, and others are willing to put in the time to customize it as much as possible. So um, finding the right dimensions there is really important. Another aspect of this is, uh, for a large part, we do have VR sessions that are increasing in time, and with every year we, we see more people spending more time in VR. And that also changes how we look at this, because things like cognitive load, uh, any dissonance we have in, in how we perceive audio, uh, starts to play a larger effect and or a larger role as we spend more time in VR. So these are things that I think we, to your point, Poppy, I think we also need to include in uh, in how we judge spatial audio technologies and how we apply for personalization. Well, I, I love that because um, that's tr definitely true. And I think in your in your comments, Varun, during the panel on Monday, you made a, a reference to neuroplasticity um, taking place to, with different HRTFs under different conditions, you know, that your brain adop adapts to a different HRTF. And that can happen, not always, it happens, you know, because again, depending on how far away you are a particular HRTF and how, how much your brain's having to engage, it's going it, to, different people are going to be, you know, have different deltas. But the point is, after you do that, when you take your headphones off and you come back to, you know, the natural world, you're now also putting a different tax on your system. Those alterations, you know, you have limited resources and every time you're forcing your brain into a different box, it creates, it has different ramifications that can have implications on the success of localization outside that virtual environment. One thing, um, Stefania, so I love what you talk about with empathy in terms of giving someone else other empathetic experience. So I think you asked whether HRTF personalization matters. I would love to, so, so I think some of the most powerful demos, and if any of you have do or don't do this with regard to HRTFs is, and you know, I, I, I love to do this for people, is to just play people different HRTFs of different body types, different ethnicities, different sex, and have them listen to the same content. It's not subtle in any way, it's massive. And while they might not be having the, you know, the experience, exact experience of the other individual, they suddenly recognize empathy. It's, it's, it is a, a track to empathy of how broken an experience may be for a particular demographic. And instead of asking people, is it better for you or better for me? It's recognizing here's 20% of the population that isn't you. This is how broken it might be for them. Here's another 20%. This is how broken it might be for them. And when you realize the heterogeneity across those different experiences, it, it is eye-opening. So that's very much the type of empathetic engagement that I think you, you, you definitely um, use in your lab. So. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's matching a lot with some of the work that Sony has done. They've, they have a big database of HRTFs. And as they were playing for generic HRTFs for larger populations of people, 
they were um, measuring essentially the distance of how far the HRTF the user had was from their own individual HRTF, which had been measured. And they characterized that if you were within a certain small radius of distance to the generic HRTF you were listening to, you got a very, very compelling, very awesome experience. And as you get farther away, the experience seems to drop off. And then there was a point at which it sort of dropped off a cliff, um, you know, where some users just simply reported, yeah, it's kind of cooler than stereo, but I don't really perceive the, the giant 3D. Um, so yeah, it, it would definitely depend. Right? Some change, some differences are going to be very bad at introducing systemic biases. Right? If you get the ITD around the head distance wrong, your azimuth is consistently off, which um, will lead to a lot more cognitive load and a more fatiguing experience. So. You need to have perfect HRTF individualization, perhaps not, but there probably are characteristics that are very high bang for the buck. So here's another thought, which is uh, I have strong confidence and I strongly believe that we will get to the point in the future where we have increasingly more personalized experiences and the technology is able to scale and include a lot more people. We're not there yet. Um, and, and it's not just for audio, it's across the board. Um, I agree. Tracking uh, um, the way our lenses are set up, even even the design of headsets across the industry. Uh, so it's a question for for the panel. What are the ways, or what, what are the technologies you think that we should be accelerating or paying more attention to to just bring make it a lot more inclusive for people? Uh, Varun, you cut off in the very end. I don't. Did he cut off for others? I cut off for me. Could you restate? I can repeat your... that. Uh, yeah. What are the technologies or areas of research or elsewhere that we should be paying a lot more attention to to accelerate uh, our trajectory and make things a lot more inclusive for a lot more people and therefore a lot more personalized as well? well I think the stuff Poppy so, was talking uh, about earlier was, was spot on target, right? There's the notion of having relatively inexpensive earbuds that can monitor all of these sorts of things uh, is, is super exciting, especially since that's a kind of product that it, at least it, it seems like it would be able to pretty quickly be lowered in price to make it much more broadly accessible. So those sorts of things where you can focus on things that aren't going to always require, you know, giant compute or, you know, very expensive technology. I, I was really, really excited by that. By the way, Poppy, thanks again for your, you know, you, you're talking about different uh, modes of um, sensory data made me decide to not uh, be on the panel on in 2D mode. And I ran and I got my <laughs> quest to make sure that there were things like head motion and other ways of uh, transmitting information. So. So hope, unfortunately, my controller battery is almost out. So if my hand just stays stuck like this at some point, that's why. <laughs> yes, and I'm over here in 2D mode. <laughs> that's great. Uh, I mean, personalization and the, the headphone experience, personalization, you know, the, you know, the, the the people, I mean, Varun, you're, you're, you know, the, the platform that um, not just saccade information, the dilation brings to so many different, um, uh, clo in closing the loop in terms of insights that can benefit the individual is huge. Um, you know, if you think about someone that has any degree of hearing capacity, you know, hearing loss uh, in an, you know, or issues in a noisy environment, because you can have perfectly good audiograms and still have uh, difficulty hearing in noisy environments, we've got you know, different types of hair cells support those different functions. And um, the, uh, you know, you can imagine the, the importance of destigmatizing things like uh, wearing a hearing device is, is really important. And uh, when you're in a noisy environment, you can use cognitive effort driven by, say, a pair of glasses or even by, you know, some sort of GS, you know, could be on the earbud, but the you know, glasses become really informative uh, to modify signal to noise uh, ratios. 
uh, without an individual having to engage directly with a device, which makes it more seamless, makes it suddenly transformative in terms of them being in an interaction that, you know, the microphone picks up that, you know, there's maybe been an increase in voice level to know that, you know, and also um, an assessment of the background noise, background, the fact there's a conversation going on, that there is a cognitive effort, a load that's being managed, uh, being, uh, <clears throat> being captured through the dilation of people. We can measure, you know, we definitely can measure these types of things easily with um, you know, eye trackers in the market today um, that are very cost efficient. But now, you know, that's gonna be in, in glasses that people are wearing. So, you know, you, you close the loop in terms of both your your environment, but also your device, you know, whether it's you're watching, a, you're engaged in a show, you're engaged uh, online in different ways. Um, uh, in, in virtual environments, and how does how do you pick up on that? Uh, picking up on mental health in uh, you know, or depression in the voice uh, with even like online you know gaming gaming networks. That's something that could potentially be very powerful for uh, engaging with you know uh, youth that are you know in in ways that are but um, uh, where where you know engagement can help uh, individuals. Again, there are. Uh, a multitude of things that can be captured that would have beneficial aims towards the society, towards the individual. Um, you know, the headphone, it's not just HRTF. Again, you know, these things definitely have become scalable, but you know, hearing capacity, multiple, you know, iPhone enables you, the iPhone, the, the, the new generation with, you know, enables you to uh, upload uh, your, uh, your, your hearing, you know, hearing capacity test, whether it's through a company like Mimi or others, into how your device supports your personalization. Um, these are you're starting to see these be scalable, mainstream, and also targeted towards you know enabling all users to have a better experience through different um, you know different forms of of capture. I, I think that you know because headphone, it's definitely a there, there's a big a full stack that includes you know. HRTF personalization of hearing capacity, device transforms, and and environment intelligence, and those all need to come together for the best um, experience for individuals. Wonderful. So I see in the audience that we have like quite a few content creators, and um, my panelists are so fantastic that they've taken us through two of the topics that we really were um, very interested in discussing. Um, but I'm actually wanting to ask the question to you know, perhaps um, Brian, um, can you kick off a conversation about the implications for creators and how we can start thinking about um, facilitating these ideas around embodiment and empathy in the work that we do when we when we create different experiences across the spectrum from virtual augmented mixed reality spatial computing etc yeah I, as i was watching um over room yesterday and then and, and poppy today i was thinking about as, as somebody who is looking to you know create audio experiences right if, um if music is sometimes talked about as one of the most efficient ways to transfer emotion from one person's brain to another person's brain, right? We can take a lot of words to do it. We can kind of do it in pictures, but that's one of the key roles of uh, sound, uh, certainly uh, music in lots of different types of audiovisual experiences. And it's a little bit tricky because, um, you know, as a musician, uh, an individual piece of music is going to be so, you know, although there, there are certain I hate to call them cliches, but let's call them tools or techniques that we use to try to convey emotion, right? Fast tempos, excitement, and, uh, you know, slowing harmonic rhythm down can lead to more relaxation and so on. It's still very difficult to compete with a lot of the inbred ex or ingrained experiences that people have had. For example, if there's a particular song where it reminds you of a painful breakup when you were in high school, that's a very unique experience to you. And the idea of a composer or a sound designer having access to that kind of feedback from what it is you're presenting to them to how are they reacting and how does that maybe differ from the a reaction maybe you were intending to get, I think really opens up a, a, a tremendous amount of, of potential for sort of micro tailoring of experiences and you know whole new sets of tools to be created to let 
um, composers, sound designers, uh, creative people more accurately convey the things they're trying to convey. So I, I think it's uh, there's, there's a lot of interesting work that you know you could spend How the next you... 25 years working on. I, I love that sentiment and I, I have a question how you think about this and, and creators. So, I mean, like when you think about, because I've had this conversation with artists because like Leo Tolstoy has this, this, you know, um, essay on what is art and for him, he defines art in this way that it only exists when the intent of the creator is sort of realized by the individual on the other end. And I know many artists, you know, like, you know, it's art, is the goal to create and I'm, I'm just you know, which now is just it's it's not just using theoretical musings it's a reality you can actually know that right but it's um you know there's the is it to create this this um you know highly tailored suit that you take people on a journey where you know potentially there's metadata that is you know uh, capturing sentiment and emotion in, included in in what the targets are and then you know the environment the content is um, optimizing to assure that the user is experiencing what that metadata is you know, is capturing in the creative um, stream that's been authored essentially you know so there's a there's a truth that's the target throughout these experiences or is it that you know the the artistic creation is made and you know part of that beauty is then you know the heterogeneity in how we each experience it. I mean, I think at times it's both, and when it's one or the other, and how we enable those, you know, enable that type of of, of shift and, and creative tool to you know individuals is, I, I think, a really interesting question because they're both possible. They're, I mean, they're both. You know, we can think about them differently today. Yeah, I think it's a fascinating way of thinking about it. I hadn't heard that that whole state call. I'm going to look that up and make sure I steal that um, for the future. Um, Certainly, I think from the content creators chair, you know, I'm thinking of composers and sound designers or film directors, they're thinking, you know, here's the vision that I want to convey. And I'm successful if I've put that into their heads. And maybe some of the beauty of it is, well, that may be the intent of the content creator, but that's not the way. You know, it, maybe the art of it is the fact that that's not actually what really happens. Um, we certainly go to a lot of trouble to try to anticipate and put into the heads of the viewers what we want them to hear right that's that's why we have calibrated movie studio audio right but so that the experience of the mixer is identical to what the audience hears and you don't get fletcher munson effects because the absolute volume levels are different and so on so that, but if i if, if i have hearing loss you know i'm i'm not hearing you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, that, 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 you know, that's and, and, and even if you don't have hearing loss, you still have different uh, things. When I, I'm thinking of, again, as you were giving your talk, you know, what if there were a mechanism of delivery where I could subtly adjust the mix based upon mm -hmm. your um, your pupil diameter, and because Absolutely. I now detect you're not really paying attention to the part of the music that I wanted you to pay attention to. So I'm going to subtly push you over to where I want you to be. That, I think that kind of stuff is fascinating. There's a, there's a tension here, though. I think it's a good kind of tension because it helps find a balance between as we get to more personalization, more data available about what's happening in an experience, how much of this do we want to have creative control and also as a platform want exposed to the people creating content for the platform? Because by, say, exposing detail of the emotional state is that the right thing we want to do from uh, from a privacy standpoint and who is able to from from a creative standpoint it is it is it okay to have the level of control um it i think it's it's fascinating from being able to to apply creativity to uh, all of these different kinds of data sources but is it the right thing to do yeah there's a there's a big um argument that goes on, for example, in video games, right? Do you have sliders that allow people to essentially alter the mix, the music, sound effects, dialogue, and so on? And certainly a compelling argument could be made for accessibility, that yes, you'd like to be able to highlight the dialogue for people with hearing impairments. But most of the content creators that I talk to tend to be pretty, you know, 
the reason I'm the content creator is because I know what I want the mix to be and I shouldn't need to allow an end user to tailor the experience to their own needs. So there's, it kind of depends, you know, what side of the fence you decide to be on. Well, I think that's where yeah, but, it gets interesting to like, can you author, you know, some degree of metadata that captures what that intent is that then the technology, not just not the user necessarily, the technology is helping close that loop based on um, the user experience, right? <clears throat> and that's like, that's a form of empathetic technology is it's, it's mm -hmm. optimizing to the state of the individual. So, yeah. yeah, because uh, yeah, it's yeah, like what you, what you okay. said, uh, no, yeah. like what you said in your talk, Poppy, that, uh, I mean, how do you know that you created the right experience? I mean, it might be the right experience for you, but what about for everybody else? How can you measure that and how yeah. can you validate? Is it about measurement? Between... Sorry, I, I was just going to throw in like, is it about measurement and validation or is it about just ensuring that the um, that the experience is um, achieving the goals that you set out when you went into the whole design process or creating the technology. Um, we are running just a, f uh, we only have a couple of minutes left and I hate to have the last word, but I will certainly, um, if, if the panelists are happy to, we can take uh, one or two questions before we wrap the session. Sure. 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 Wonderful. Okay. Instructions from our wonderful moderator. Um, you should have a button for raising your hand and they will field the questions. Hey, Ethan, go ahead and ask your question. Cool, cool. Uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, awesome talk and, and really fantastic panel. Um, actually, just jumping off of kind of where the panel ended previously, I was wondering about um, user-generated content, right? And how do we kind of drive user-generated content to uh, not have implicit ableism in it and sort of these implicit uh, design errors uh, to that make them difficult to use uh, for other folks uh, through technology. Mm -hmm. Could you clarify okay. what you mean by user-generated content? Yeah, just uh, say you've got a piece of software like a, like some sandbox creative mode in the game, right, uh, for a VR game. And they're designing a, a level, perhaps they're, they're sculpting models, uh, but they may sculpt inputs that are difficult to, for example, reach, uh, to um, use in some specific sense, uh, perhaps something that uh, requires like very specific um, as assumptions about about motor uh, ability, etc. Yeah, so you, UGC content that's in building bias in in ways that you know it, 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 we're maybe trying to tackle in other areas, but but is is that what you're sort of yeah? Or yeah, ex you, exactly. Bias of success, I guess. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if. Okay, if, okay. if uh, we, we typically see these uh, things approached in multiple ways. I don't think there's a silver bullet here. Um, so right from community guidelines and such environments to uh, technologies that can help detect uh, mechanisms. And I think it, these need to be built right into the tool set itself. So we're able to guide people to make the right choices and make them as inclusive as possible. And the third is what we generally see for wider user-generated content across the internet is, is, is moderation. Uh, that, that comes with scalability challenges and other challenges as well to ensure that it's a really robust and inclusive system. But I think there's, there's, a, there's a lot of mileage in, in, in bringing this thinking into, into the tools that are being built into such user-generated world and, and how these tools are exposed to people and the kind of affordability that they provide as well. I, I wholly agree with uh, Varun in this. Uh, there's like, the, especially the, the platforms and tool sets, the, the companies that support them are the best place to enable, mm -hmm. or you know, to, to facilitate reduction in bias and, and accessibility in these cases. It, it needs to be built into it so that <coughs> someone is informed during the creation process and enabled to support, um, not you know, so support uh, the, the demographics and breadth that they Want, should be supporting. Uh, thanks a ton. <coughs> All right, uh, David, 
go ahead and ask your question. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, I can't hear you. cannot hear me. <laughs> there, better. Better now? Um, yes, I guess. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, to tie in with this previous point about how to, uh, I guess, make the audio experience as acceptable for different users, I'm curious if you guys have any thoughts about what uh, some technologies that have come out, like Omnio, or ones that actually plug on, I guess, to the end of like micro or headphones for users and allow them to change the profile universally so that if you have tinnitus or other cases of hearing loss that will actually boost frequencies or different sound experiences around that. Be curious if you have any thoughts on how that would implement, especially from the perspective that Brian brought up as a content creator wanting to share your individual experience with as many different people with what you have. Um, be curious on your thoughts on that. Um, I, I just have a quick comment. I, I mean, tinnitus is a funny one. That's definitely not the best way to approach uh, mitigation of tinnitus. but. Um, yeah, the one thing I'd say to content creators who, who fear having any of their content modified, if an individual, I mean, again, it should be the intent of the creation that you want translated in many, you know, can't, how do you think about that? If someone can't hear, if they're not experiencing it, or if it causes them to just not engage because it's, it's painful, it's uncomfortable, um, you know, certain content for me, if it's, you know, head collapse or, you know, if I get collapse, and it can give me a migraine. Um, and that means that's something I'm not going to engage with in any way unless I can experience it in a successful way. So recognizing that the intent is, is a different, is, is probably the most important target. And how do you, you know, we're not there yet where we can marry both the creative intent with the human experience on the other side. But we're getting to a place where we get, to, I think, think really uh, more thoughtfully about that. So, um, you know, I, I would just, you know, if someone is having tonight, if they're having an uncomfortable experience, that that's the choice is they won't engage or they might engage with a slightly modified experience. And for say someone with hearing loss, it's like, you know, subtitles are probably not sufficient. We can do better than that. And I, I, I'll defer to other um, individuals on the panel now. But. I think there's a difference between um, corrective technologies or things that generally make it a lot more inclusive, whether it's hearing, hearing correction or other areas which I think we should be a lot more bullish on and, and, and accelerate and help people out as much as possible. Um, the other aspect of it is when we're creating content, it, you need to really ensure that there's a diverse set. I, I can't do high motion stuff in VR. I, I feel sick. So uh, I find the prompts about how comfortable and experiences in VR really helpful. So I, I make a conscious choice. That's, an, that's another angle to this. And the third is is having really deep data about what that experience is like. And then that's where I, I tread more carefully because I think um, that's when we end up we have as, as, as a platform, it could change the creative intent of of an experience, which is where I think there's, there's a there's a blurry line there that needs more definition. Um, one thing I might say is, you know, I, I do have a slightly different perspective than you, Varun, which is great. Right? Um, I don't separate corrective technologies from uh, personalized technologies in many cases because, you know, technologies that we can, you know, we all have some degree of hearing loss. We all have some degree of, uh, uh, you know, if an HRTF doesn't work for someone, it can give them a headache. If, if, if someone has, you know, our underlying biology and capacity is all very different. And I think the uh, idea that we treat, you know, we have accessibility or corrective versus um, personalized for the individual to optimize their experience is, is, you know, something that not everyone thinks that way. I do. And I, I think, you know, a lot of the, the opportunities we can have to, in, you know, to build experiences that reach everyone and how these are realized, how, how they um, are discovered within the technology is, is um, improved when we think about, you know, our own differences and, um, um, the, the potential mitigations that we're always yeah, you know, I, trying to. I, I do want to clarify by correct correction. I, I don't. I didn't want to like uh, set aside personalization. It is included in that. Just the level of level of control and the level of data that ultimately flows the experience. Okay. That's where we need to figure out the line. Got it. Uh, yeah. Corrective to reach the creative intent 
on a, a big screen. Are there any more questions? Are we happy to wrap it up now and um, take the next 24 minutes to have a little bit of a chit chat in the lobby while we reset for the uh, tutorials, workshops, and papers sessions throughout the rest of the day? Silence is golden, so I'll call it. Okay, everyone, thank you so much Thanks, for um, your thank wonderful you, questions. Thank you so much to our really fantastic conversation from these panelists. Um, I commented before that they literally drove themselves and that's exactly what they did. Um, again, um, we have a fantastic program for the rest of the day. Um, join us in 24 minutes um, after you know a nice little coffee break or dinner break, whatever time of day is appropriate for you. Um, and feel free to approach any of these wonderful panelists with additional questions if you see them around the show for the rest of the day. Um, again, thank you so much, and we'll see you soon. Emojis, emojis, emojis. Clap, 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 clap.